Hello everyone and welcome to The Chrissy B Show, the UK's only TV programme dedicated to mental health and wellbeing topics. Working life can be really stressful at times regardless of what you're doing, but there's more to the risks at work than emotional distress alone. Every year on the 28th of April it is World Day for Safety and Health at Work and today we're bringing attention to what it is that your employer should be ensuring you have in your work environment and also what you as an employee can do to stay safe. My guests for today are Vice Chair of the Health and Safety Lawyers Association, Gerard Forlin, and he'll be talking about the work that he does internationally to help regulate health and safety laws. And we also have HR Associate Maria Asima, who'll be talking more about the stress side of work. And we'll also be revisiting an interview with someone who had an accident, and she'll be speaking about how it mentally affected her. And we also have a video with Dr. Rob Hicks about blood pressure. Later on, I'll also be sharing my own tips on keeping a positive mental attitude at work. But first, we have a quick interview with Nancy LePink of the International Labour Organization to explain more about World Day for Health and Safety at Work and why it was founded in the first place. Hello, Nancy, and thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so, Nancy, can you tell us all about World Day for Safety and Health at Work and why it was founded? Sure, I can. Um, it was founded in 2003, um, and the purpose uh, for establishing a World Day for Safety and Health at Work is in part because each and every year um, there are 2.3 million work-related deaths, um, and many of those, and the, in fact, the vast majority of those, are due to work-related diseases. And so the day was established, one, and most uh, importantly, to promote um, the prevention of occupational fatalities, mm -hmm. um, injuries, and diseases, and then to also create global awareness um, regarding growing or emerging issues related to occupational safety and health. Okay. And how do you actually go about raising awareness? Because you have this is something that happens every year. Or is it just uh, through sort of going through the media, or is it other avenues that you use? Um, well, there's a variety of avenues. Um, first, of, first of all, the ILO, um, of course, uh, identifies um, what, is, what is the emerging issue or the growing trend mm -hmm. that it's going to focus on this year, of course, being work-related stress. Mm -hmm. um, and then it creates often a very thorough and comprehensive report on the issue. Um, but also then it uh, creates uh, and works with countries um, who now, it's a growing, growing number of countries have now often a day or even a week and sometimes even a month where they mm -hmm. focus on workplace safety and health issues in their countries. They engage mm -hmm. workers and employers. And so it becomes a very multi, multi-faceted and multi-participant programs. Okay. And are you, are you seeing quite a change in people's attitudes towards health and safety since, since you've been having this day? Um, yes, of course, it's not only as a result of the day, but yes, mm -hmm. I think that um, people's understanding that um, work isn't inherently dangerous or doesn't need to necessarily have negative impacts on workers' health, and that these many of the things that cause those hazards um, can be prevented. Okay. And any message you'd like to give to employers out there who aren't really that, <laughs> they're not really quite meticulous in, in looking after their employees, what would you say? What advice would you give? Well, I think that it's, it's greatly underestimated mm -hmm. the impact that working conditions, whether they be physical hazards or mental health hazards, um, have on workplaces and mm -hmm. that there is a growing body of data that indicates that paying attention to these things not only keeps your workers' health and safety and sends them home each day mm -hmm. uh, well, but that it uh, significantly affects productivity and yeah. the ability of that uh, company to compete in a global uh, economy. Yeah. So there's benefits for everyone all around, really. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. All right, absolutely. Nancy, no, thank you so, so much for joining us and for that information. OK, be safe. Thank you. <laughs> all right, guys, so don't go away, because now we have the news with Candice Latouche.
Hello, Candice. Hello, Christy. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm actually really excited to share with you what I've been reading about. Okay. Um, so I've been looking into health and state safety stats, health mm -hmm. and safety at work, and I'll move on a little bit later onto something different. Um, so I was reading the hsc.gov website, mm -hmm. um, and I found some statistics from 2014, 2015, just about you know general work-related accidents and incidents. Mm -hmm. um, so it may shock you to learn that 1.2 million people suffer um, f suffered from a work-related illness, um, which I think is quite a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And actually, 2,538 people died from were deaths due to past asbestos exposures. Oh. Yeah, so oh. you know that was kind of from a while ago. Yeah, That's something yeah. that we changed because we understood that that was really um, it needed to change because lots of people were becoming ill from it. So that actually happened in 2013. Mm -hmm. So that was almost two, well, just over two and a half thousand people. Um, passed away. Um, again, that year, 2014 to 15, 142 workers were killed at work, wow. um, which is really, really sad. Um, 76,000 other injuries to employees were reported under Riddle. Mm -hmm. So we do see that there's, you know, we do, you know, we understand these injuries could be from, I don't know, something minor, you know, to maybe just a, like a slight burn or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a scratch or something along those lines, but also to more extreme things as well. So it's really important to, you know, follow those health and safety guidelines at work to make sure you're looking yeah. after yourself. Um, there were 611,000 injuries occurred at work, according to the Labour Force survey. Um, 27.3 million working days lost due to work-related illness wow. and workplace injury. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on one side, you're like, well, don't we care more about the people than <laughs> the amount of days lost due to work? But obviously, it does affect the workflow. It does mm -hmm. affect companies. Um, it affects colleagues as well. So if there's someone yeah, who yeah, is taken ill, um, it affects the colleagues because maybe there's someone out of work. Again, that could be due to the, the workplace or could be due to the person and negligence mm -hmm. and things like that. But it does affect the workplace. And 14.3 billion estimated costs of injuries and ill health from current working conditions. That's 2013 to 2014. Mm -hmm. So it does also cost quite a bit. Um, and I was looking a bit more at the cost to Britain, again, on hse.gov website. Um, and they say the majority of costs actually fall on the individuals. So it's actually the employees, the people who've actually suffered from an illness, that majority of the cost falls on. And this could be, um, you know, the cost lost because they can't go to work. Because mm -hmm. we know that there's some companies that do offer, you know, you get covered for um, being away for sickness. But I think some companies only offer a certain amount of days, I believe. Mm -hmm. So once those days are up, if they're still unwell, then maybe they're not getting paid for that. Maybe they, they're losing out on money themselves. Um, and again, to the employer, 2.8 billion, 2.8 billion pounds, which I think is not as much as it is to the individual, but it is still quite a lot. And then the government, 3.4 billion. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's a high cost. And again, I don't like to talk about money when talking about people's health and talking mm. about injury, but obviously in terms of the economy, it's very, you know, it does affect, it does yeah. really affect the economy as well. Um, but what I actually wanted to go on to, Chrissy, was not just looking at um, health and safety in the workplace, but also looking at um, health and safety in the home. Because I'm someone, I'm very into health and safety. I used to be a teacher, mm -hmm. so I was really, and I used to be a youth worker, and so I used to be really on the whole uh, risk assessment. You know, uh, this, this was back, the, I don't if, know if you remembered, yeah. maybe five to 10 years ago, people were really, you know, risk assessments were very important. You know, you really, it kind of, I think it might have been when it all came in, you had to do a risk assessment for everything. Everything had to be risk assessed. You need to do this, you need to do that. You couldn't take children on a walk down the street without <laughs> risk assessing, you know, if you take the child down the street, you have to look at the danger of death due to car accident, falling, tripping, slipping, you know, and look at the extremes. And I used to love doing risk assessments. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I just so used to really love. I used to like filling out forms. I like forms and things like that as well. So um, I was really, you know, I, I, it was just kind of built within me through my work. Mm. I was one of those people who would look at risk and look at, you know, danger and make sure things are locked away safely. Make sure things are, especially when I got home. I would like. I remember we. Um, the fire brigade came in and they do like a they put in your the fire alarms i don't know if they still do this mm -hmm. and they would actually explain to you like how you need to check your home um, and what you need to do each night and so i wasn't i don't think i was there this particular day my sister was and she was explaining all the things that i do before i go to bed at home and they were like that's so great that's what you're meant to do <laughs> i check the windows i check the doors all those kind of things because you never know what's going to happen yeah. taking out certain plugs certain things shouldn't be left in um so at work i was very health and safety but this took me into the home as well. 
So, like I said, safety at work is important, but safety in the home is important as well. So the Royal Society um, for the Prevention of Accidents actually said that more accidents happen at home than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we get really annoyed by these health and safety rules at work. But actually, they might be teaching us something quite good. I don't yeah. know if you've, yeah, they're, they're actually teaching us, you know, to, to take more care. So we may be really annoyed by all the regulations put in place, but actually if we start applying them to the home, mm, maybe we could yes, reduce true. some of those risks there as well. Yeah. Um, an example of this is that I did one time when I was at a workplace, I saw someone put a knife into the toaster when it was still plugged into the wall. <laughs> and I was like, you're an adult. Seriously, you don't know that that's dangerous, <laughs> and it was still plugged into the wall. And I was like, I was like, what are you? You know, you can't, you can't do that. That's really, really dangerous. And they were like, oh, what? They literally just didn't know mm -hmm. that that was something dangerous to do. And so I actually went and I told the health and safety officer, and I was like, you need to put up a sign because I've seen, I actually saw more than one person do it. And luckily, they put up a sign. I believe that may have saved many lives. Well um, done, Candice. I know. I feel so good. I feel so good about that. I believed I saved some lives by doing that. But then at the home as well. Now that, she, yeah. now that this person learned that at work, they can also apply that to the home as well. Mm. So um, every year, there are approximately 6,000 deaths as a result of a home accident. So mm. as a result of something that happened at home. And I'm not saying that there are things that, you know, they could have learned through the health and safety at work, but you never know. Maybe there are some yeah. things that if we pay it's attention, because we actually, you know, people do health and safety training at work. You don't do health and safety training at home. You don't. And I so, think sometimes it's not that specific thing that you might learn at work, but just making just being more aware and being yeah. more open-minded and watching Definitely. out for things in general yeah. can help in the home as well. It makes sure your mind more alert, I suppose. Definitely, mm -hmm. and it exactly, it makes you think, you know, look at yeah. risks maybe in a different way. Um, and funnily enough, one fact that I found is that boys have more accidents than girls. Really? Yeah. I don't know, I'm not, I wasn't actually surprised by that. <laughs> I have nephews, I was not surprised by that. I was not at all surprised by that. Um, the, I think there's a, I think girls may have more of a sense of danger I mean, my nephews, especially when they were younger, they would just throw themselves off the sofa. You know, I don't think they really have so much of a of that, you know, that, that fear that girls may have. Um, okay. And the cost to society of UK home accident injuries has been estimated at forty five point six three billion um, pounds annually. Wow. Apparently, and it also says forty five point. Yeah, so 45.63 billion annually. So it's quite a bit. The cost is quite high. Wow, so, definitely. Yeah. Candice, thank you so, thank so much you. for your news today. Thanks. Thank you. All right, guys, so don't go away because after the break, I have joining me Vice Chair of the Health and Safety Lawyers Association, Gerard Fallin, and he'll be talking about the work that he does internationally to help regulate health and safety laws. And there'll also be a video with Dr. Rob Hicks all about blood pressure. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to today's programme, everyone, where we are speaking all about health and safety at work. And joining me now, I have Gerard Fallin, QC. Hello, Gerard. Hi, Chrissy. <laughs> Thanks so you? much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me on. <laughs> so, um, Gerard, well, tell us a bit about what you do, first of all. Well, Chrissy, I'm a Queen's Council QC in London, mm -hmm. specialising in three areas, catastrophic transport disaster litigation, mm -hmm. health and safety and environment, product liability, and corruption and bribery matters. And okay. I work all over the world. I have chambers in London, Sydney, and Singapore. Oh, wow, so you get to travel quite a bit then. Yeah, a lot of air miles, yeah. a lot of jet lag, <laughs> but we're getting there. But you're getting there. Okay, so obviously this program is about health and safety. Sure. So can you tell us a bit about what employers should be doing and what they should be looking out for to ensure the, the safety of their workforce? Well, it's a very important issue, as we know. It's their duty in law to mm -hmm. make sure that their workers are as safe as possible. But it's also the duty of the employees mm -hmm. to look after their own safety, health and welfare. So it's yeah. a two-way sword. And it's a criminal offence if it doesn't take place. And the consequences of that, as there could be prosecutions, mm -hmm. either against individuals and or 
uh, companies or organisations. Yeah. Uh, if they're convicted, they get a criminal conviction, which is not good news. It affects mm -hmm. all kinds of issues of reputation, insurance. Uh, it means that if they have another problem, that mm -hmm. previous conviction might be made known to a jury. It also increasingly covers massive uh, sentencing issues. And the sentencing of corporations and individuals mm -hmm. have dramatically increased since February the 1st, 2016 in the UK. Fines mm -hmm. have gone up probably, we're still trying to ascertain because it's early days, Chris, as you can mm -hmm. imagine, probably 10 to 15 times what they wow. would have been on the 31st of January. It's a massive increase, isn't it? Yeah. It's a massive increase. Some think it's uh, gone too far. Some people may say that it will maybe make certain organisations think about how much more they want to stay in the UK, alongside all mm -hmm. the other regulatory issues they have to deal with. Some say it hasn't gone far enough and yeah. that the fine should be even higher. But I think the interesting thing as a lawyer, Chrissy, it's not when the offence took place that these sentencing guidelines trigger. It's the day that you go to court. So on the 1st of February, mm -hmm. these, these new sentencing guidelines have bit. So you could have been fined a tenth on the 31st of January yeah. to what you could have been fined on the 1st of February. And some people feel that's a little unfair. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of consequences. And the most important thing of all is you want your workplace to be happy. Definitely, you want people to yeah. stay there. You don't want people to be sick. You want mm -hmm. to be people to, to really be relishing working rather than thinking, oh, God, I hate going there this morning because it's so stressful and so dangerous. Mm -hmm. So there's a moral issue, a legal issue, an insurance issue. Yeah. It's a really important issue, Chrissy. What do you think are the, the basics that every uh, employer should ensure they have and they have in place for, for their employees? Because obviously, you know, the smaller uh, companies, they can't sure. really afford to do everything. No. But what are sort of the basics that everyone should have? Well, there are, there are some basic rules that they have to follow. It's not mm -hmm. a question of uh, they can if they want to. Um, they have to risk assess uh, the situations, what are more dangerous, and deal things before something happens. And if something does happen, they can't just uh, leave it. They've actually got to re-risk assess position. So for example, Chrissy, mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't happen. If I trip over your table in this wonderful studio uh, this evening, um, you can't just say, oh, well, he was a silly fool to trip over that yeah. uh, table. You, you, I may have been a silly fool, mm -hmm. but you would have to re-risk assess whether that table was dangerous or not. Okay. Even if you decide in the end you don't have to make changes, you have to re risk assess mm -hmm. something when an incident's happened. So definitely don't ignore anything, even how, however small it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bottom line is from small acorns, huge trees can fall, and that's a uh, flow. So at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it's really, really important that the small issues are looked at as well as the, uh, as the bigger issues, because you mm -hmm. just don't know where these accidents can come from. But there are certain, we know, high risk factors depending on the industry mm -hmm. and the industry has to sort of also take those into account. For example, the majority of deaths uh, in the workplace are from falls from height mm -hmm. or reversing lorries. So these are the primary things. But even if you're not working in construction, you've got sort of live issues that may or may yeah. not be more important depending on the industry. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned obviously that the employees need to take responsibility yes. as well. What, what, how, can, how can employees best stay safe in their workplace? Um, they've got to follow the rules and they've mm. got to challenge the rules if they don't feel the rules are right. Okay. Um, but there's new, these new guidelines, Chrissy, that I've talked about are interesting because they don't just affect the sentencing of organisations, companies or whatever. They mm -hmm. actually have massively increased the chances of people going to prison as individuals, okay. either yeah. as employers or as employees. Mm -hmm. So if an employee does something that's very reckless, that could actually uh, risk himself or herself being injured or killed, but also risk the people that are working with them 
they can be prosecuted. And a number of people, increasing number of people, yeah. are being prosecuted even though they've been injured themselves. Yeah, you don't hear that much so incident. much, do you? It's you don't hear about that so much, but I yeah. suppose it depends what you're looking for, right? Yeah. I looked, I see these cases because I get them coming out daily. And there's a lot more than people think there are, mm -hmm. actually. That's quite interesting. So, That's good it, for everyone to know, actually, because it's, it's good yeah. to look out for that. Because it's not just uh, a duty, it's the duty of you trying to make sure everyone around you is safe. So if you yeah. do something reckless, you are in, inevitably endangering other people around mm -hmm. you. I mean, one classic case was that uh, a man in charge of a building yard on a Friday uh, wanted to get everything cleaned up so that everyone could go. Um, he put, as the uh, yard manager, an accelerant on the skip where they were trying to burn things. And of course, he caught fire. Oh, gosh. He was running around the yard. Yeah. He was very badly burnt. But when he came out of hospital, he was prosecuted because of the risk he actually put around his workers while this was all happening. So, you know, this is what I'm trying to say. It's not something that's just about the big fat cat employers, yeah, employers taking risks, yeah. it's the employees as well. We've all got really a duty, me, know. you, Chrissy, everybody. Yeah, everyone. Can I just mention one final yes, thing, Chrissy? Yeah. The more I travel, the more I realize that industries and companies have the same issues, whether it's in Australia, the Far East, uh, the Middle East, or Europe, or mm -hmm. America. So Britain has actually the second or first or second safest workplace in the world alongside Sweden. So we are Ooh. certainly doing something right. Okay. Um, and I'm nervous when we try and tinker too much with it because you can make things worse sometimes. But we, you know, change is important. But the interesting thing, and I just want to leave this to your viewers because it's important because you've got viewers from all over the world. Mm -hmm. If a company makes a mistake, if, for example, in health and safety in one part of the world, yeah. increasingly the regulators are becoming aware of that and they mm -hmm. will start to look at those organisations in their own countries. Okay. And also, if you have a bad safety record from one country, increasingly the judges and the prosecutors are trying to factor that in when they prosecute in this country. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of what goes to Vegas stays in Vegas anymore, Chrissy. This is about the fact that in this global world, yeah. if, if you don't have the same high standard wherever you operate, you will be found out. Okay, good to know. Gerard, thanks so much Thank for you, speaking Sorry to, to us. No, so no problem. That's thanks great. for speaking to us and we'd love to have you on again soon. Okay, that's fantastic, <laughs> Thank Chrissy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right, guys, so don't go away because now we do have a video with Dr. Rob Hicks all about looking after your blood pressure. Hello and welcome to Doctor's Orders here at the Chrissy B Show. I'm Dr. Rob Hicks. Today we're going to be talking about blood pressure, specifically high blood pressure. Doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals seem to make quite a fuss about blood pressure, but why is that? Well, the reason is if you've got high blood pressure and it's not treated correctly, then you're at risk of suffering a heart attack, a stroke, kidney damage and for men erectile dysfunction. So how do we go about measuring high blood pressure? Well nowadays most people use an electric blood pressure monitor rather like this one. The cuff goes around the top of the, the arm, it's inflated after you press the button and then you simply just wait for the machine to give you a readout of two numbers. And those two numbers are the systolic blood pressure, that's the higher number, and that's the blood pressure within the arteries when the heart is pumping blood around the body and the lower number the diastolic blood pressure that's the pressure of blood in the arteries when the heart is relaxed and it's filling again getting ready to pump the blood around the body again in between heartbeats so ideally we like the blood pressure reading to be equal to or less than 120 as a systolic pressure the higher figure and 80 as a diastolic pressure, the lower figure. If you've got blood pressure that's 140 or above or 90 or above consistently on repeated measurements, then you've got high blood pressure. Now there are lots of risk factors that increase our chances of developing high blood pressure and why we worry so much about high blood pressure is that it very much doesn't cause symptoms for the majority of people. So that damage 
to the heart and circulation can be going on inside our body without us even knowing about it. So the risk factors to look out for, being overweight, drinking too much alcohol, consuming too much salt in the diet, spending a lot of time inactive, and of course stress. These will all increase a person's risk of developing high blood pressure and consequently suffering the often tragic consequences, the heart attacks, the strokes, that come with untreated high blood pressure. So when you've got high blood pressure, or if you want to try and avoid high blood pressure in the first place, you want to cross those risk factors off your list. So try and keep your weight at a healthy level, so that's having a body max index, a BMI of not more than 25. Make sure that you stick within the safe recommended amounts of alcohol, and for men and women, that's no more than 14 units of alcohol a week. Try not to consume more than the recommended six grams of salt a day and be as active as possible because keeping active, doing exercise, not only helps to lower blood pressure, it also helps to shed the weight, the ex extra weight that you may be carrying. And it's that extra weight that often contributes to high blood pressure. And of course, make sure you keep on top of stress because we know that stress in one way or another contributes to high blood pressure. Often it's because if we're stressed, we eat comfort foods, we're, we're not active. And that of course piles on the pounds, in turn putting our blood pressure up. So make sure you have your blood pressure checked as often as your doctor recommends. And that's doctor's orders. Thanks very much to Dr. Rob Hicks there. Well, after the break, don't go away because we have HR Associate Maria Asimov with us to talk more about stress at work and also be revisiting an interview with someone who had a serious accident that left her badly scarred. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to today's program, everyone, where we are discussing how to stay healthy and safe at work. And now joining me, I have HR associate Maria Asimov with me. Hello, Maria. Hi, Chrissy. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Thank you. So today we're going to be speaking more about stress. So we've covered the accident um, side of things, but obviously stress is a major, major thing in many workplaces. Can you tell us what the maybe work related stress exactly is and how it comes about and what we can do about it? Yeah, so work-related stress is basically the combination of where pressure and demands become too excessive for mm -hmm. an individual to manage. Mm -hmm. So in that circumstance, it will have an adverse effect on the way someone is conducting themselves in a work setting. Mm -hmm. um, someone who previously performed well at work may no longer be able to do so because of the stress that's impacting on their work. Yeah, okay. um, so it's something that employees and employers should be mindful of just to make sure that the stress isn't having an adverse and kind of detrimental effect on, on someone's workload. Okay, and is there a difference between the stress and the pressure side of things? There is. So in every aspect of life, a certain element of pressure is good. It helps mm. us to be able to perform well. Um, it kind of gives us that adre adrenaline and, mm -hmm. you know, people want to be challenged and kind of stretched in their different working lives and kind of every aspect of life. Um, like I said before, where it becomes excessive, it can be a problem. So mm -hmm. um, that beneficial aspect that comes with pressure, um, which can be good, once it becomes excessive, it then becomes stressful and can be a problem. Okay. So there is a difference between stress and um, pressure. So it's important to kind of just be mindful of when it's it's gone too far. Okay. And as an, an employer, what could you do to to help someone that says they are stressed in their workplace? There's a lot that employers um, could and also should be doing. So um, I always think it's good that employers are kind of 
or like team leaders or managers are close to their teams and they 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 understand how someone's working pattern normally is mm -hmm. and if they notice that there's anything that is changing so if someone is usually really bubbly and outgoing and you know communicative with their colleagues and suddenly they become really withdrawn or mm -hmm. they're having a lot of time out of the office that could be an indication that something's wrong and it could be personal but it could also be related to being stressed at work. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, I feel that um, employers should be having conversations. If it is identified that the problem is work-related and it's stress, they can look at you know, changing their workload slightly, mm -hmm. um, flexible working, maybe to have some time where they're out of the office, where it's like a change of um, environment. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, I feel that um, employers should be doing something to help individuals who are kind of suffering from stress. Okay. And, and in the case of, I mean, where, where would an employee know if the, for example, something like the workload is really an issue or if it's just down to that employee not being suitable for that particular position? Because it can be quite tricky sometimes, can't it? Yeah, it can. I think that where... Um, there are changes. So if someone perhaps is new to the team mm -hmm. or some or their role has drastically changed slightly or the dynamics or the structure of the team or the organisation is going through a lot of um, change or uncertainty, mm -hmm. that's where um, you know it, it can be noticeable that someone is suffering from stress and it's more related to maybe situation the situation mm -hmm. um, but I think that employers can kind of keep an eye on so if, if the change is due to maybe a merger so two companies yeah. are coming together just an extreme example um, they should really keep an eye on their workers because they know how they were in the old system. So mm -hmm. if they're suddenly coming into this new environment, it's stressful for everyone anyway. They have to learn new systems, get to know new people, etc. Yeah. Um, but in, if they start to notice that maybe someone's work is really um, slipping massively, then that could be an indication as to them not coping that well. So mm -hmm. in that situation again they should be doing as much as they can to support them and um, an organization should in ensure that people who have line manager responsibilities are suitably trained to be able to kind of spot these signs mm -hmm. and also to be able to give support um, that's also a key thing um, and on the individual side um, someone can be proactive and seek out um, any in-house kind of counseling that there okay. may be or they might want to personally sign themselves up for something like cognitive behavioural therapy. So anything that's going to help them with like resilience and being able to kind of deal with um, stress in a positive way mm -hmm. so that it's not causing them to kind of want to tear their hair out and just not be able to cope. Okay. So obviously it's important for both sides, an employer and employee to, to monitor, well, the employee to monitor themselves and see yeah. if everything's okay, but also for the employer to to make sure their workforce is happy. Yeah, it yeah. absolutely is. It, it's, um, it's a balancing act and where the two sides, employer and employee, are working well together, um, stress can be managed and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be um, you know, something that's gonna have um, a longer term or a devastating impact on an individual's life or right. kind of their working life as well and the, the, um, the company. Okay, Maria, thank you. Thank you so much for coming in again and yeah. helping us with this topic. Course, thank no you. <laughs> All right, guys, so we do have more for you. And now we're going to revisit an interview that I had with someone called Cynthia Gregoire, who is actually our resident fashion stylist on the show. And she talks here about having an accident and how she coped mentally. Let's take a look. We have another special guest who just happens to be our resident fashion stylist, Cynthia Liza Gregoire. And it has taken her a long time to speak about what she went through on national television. So I'd like to commend her for being here today. She's been very brave because it's not an easy thing to talk about. And I'd just like to warn our viewers that we're going to show some images that you might find disturbing. So if you prefer not to watch this part, please do come back in about 10 minutes time. But let's say hello to our lovely Cynthia. Hello, my darling. Hi, Kazi. How hi. are you? Good. Thank you so much, first of all, for coming on to talk about this, because I know it's, it's very hard for you. No but I also know that it's going to help and inspire a lot of our viewers, because obviously they see the confident you, they see the person that, you know, gives great advice for styling and fashion. And now the viewers are going to kind of get to know you on a deeper level now and see cool. how far you've come as well. Cool. 
Okay, so you were involved in a in a terrible accident. Can you can you tell us what happened? Uh, yeah, yeah. So and um, this happened almost ten years ago now, mm -hmm. and basically I was doing a routine chemi chemistry experiment that I had done many times before, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason that afternoon it it didn't ventilate properly and the flames came out at myself instead of up the uh, fume hood, and basically I caught fire. It was a chemical fire. And um, so after I got extinguished and everything, the ambulance was called and I was going to um, go by ambulance to the nearest burn unit. Can you describe the, the pain? <laughs> what it was, or was oh, it, it was, were you too it was, much in shock that you... Yeah, it was crazy actually. Like um, you just, it, it's something that happens like so fast, you have to quick think so fast. And of mm -hmm. course, first I was wanting to put the flames out and like, you do feel the pain, but to be honest, like I, I still remember my um, eyebrow had got singed or something and I was more concentrating on that okay. even. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of shock running through the body and things uh -huh. like that, I would say, yeah. Okay. So, but, but, but in the whole front, did it? Yeah, basically my legs were, the tops of my legs were um, burned and my face was burned and also my hand was burned as well, okay. so yeah. I was actually really lucky that the, my face actually like healed to what it, it was because it could have been a lot worse. I so mean, I could have died. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so oh, you were taken by ambulance to the hospital? Yeah, we? so we live in a very small town where I'm from and the nearest burn unit where they could care for third degree burns was in Saskatoon. So they brought me there. Uh, it took about three hours uh, to, to get there. Um, three but, hours? Yeah, yeah, by the time they saw me though that night, like they had given me a lot of painkillers because okay. when, you know, you're just so much pain from all the burns. Um, the medical people, I don't know if in the transfer or whatnot of ambulances and cars, but they never actually put cool down the burns. So it's like my skin was burning for about eight hours before they saw me. So, so they hadn't noticed this? I think it just in the, you know, it was just such a freak accident and everybody was kind of doing their thing and you just, you know, I went to sleep basically because they gave me a big morphine shot about that big and you just, I woke up and I said, and, Did and in that time you were the burning was continuing. Yeah, because like um, basically, you know, the temperature is still is very hot and mm. it wasn't removed. But I did, I did manage to put my hand in water, and, and you can see there, there's just a little bit of discoloration. Yeah. Uh -huh. But as for these, uh, they had burned down to pretty much down to the bone. Oh, so what they had to do is um, scrape the bottoms of my legs and oh. reattach them to the top. So that that was actually the most painful part is having to have the surgery after the accident. So when you woke up and realised that you were still burning, what what was what? How did you react? Oh, that was that just was really quick. Actually, I just said, you know, like what happened? And they said, well, by the time we looked at them, this is what it's it is. So you're going into surgery right away. So it wasn't like I had time to really react. It was like I was in surgery right away. Wow. So yeah, the big stuff was kind of happened after I got out of surgery, and you're on the way to recovery. So t talk us through you know, the kind of emotions that you went through, things that were going through your head after you kind of had time to think and process what had happened? Uh, yeah, that, um, I mean, it always went through my head. Like I was always wondering, I always thought to myself, oh my gosh, I never thought that this is the way my life would end up kind of thing because we, I was just two months married. We were gonna go on our honeymoon in a week. Like, you know, I had my whole life in front of me and then this happened and I guess, um, yeah, it's it's really hard to say how I, I felt. I was just really confused, I think, and in shock mainly. And I think like the main thing was like more about your body and like the way you look is so much different now, mm -hmm. you know. And nobody I knew had went through something like that. But even so, like everyone would see me with my pants, you know, with your pants on, and they don't see your burns, so they they think that you're fine. But like really inside, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I look so different now. So. It was getting used to how I looked again, I think. Did you dislike yourself when you looked at yourself in the mirror? Oh, definitely. That, that happened pretty quickly after. This um, sort of like self-hate and very critical of the way I looked and like, oh, I liked it the way it was before. You know, why can't I have my body the way it was before? Mm -hmm. It was a lot like that. And now, uh, Cynthia, because you, you have come a long way, and I know it's an emotional thing to, to speak about for you, but you... You went, I know you went through a really hard time after the accident and, you know, coming to terms with what had happened to you, but you moved on and you went into fashion and 
you you still continue to do what you what you know you loved you had a passion for how yeah. were you able to do that despite what happened to you it didn't happen overnight that's for sure i mean this is coming up 10 years now and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able to talk about it you know I, I would say i really got over things in 2009 ish so what is that that's still about four years mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't say it happened overnight at all it's it, it's a long process you know i was you know, diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, you, you know, yeah. went into a depression. And I think you almost have to hit, hit rock bottom almost. And then kind of your, your thought processes change. And then, you know, you start thinking positive again. And I think after I started doing that, you know, I, this just became so trivial in my life, I right. think. And this part, being able to wear shorts in public and a dress in public and, you know, people still ask you, you know, what happened to you kind of mm -hmm. thing. But the fact that I don't, I do, I wear it anyways, I know that I don't care anymore. Yeah. I know I'm truly kind of like over it a bit. Right. Which is, so, which is <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, which is but really, really good. I wouldn't say it comes over night. No. Mm -hmm. Now, if I can I just ask you as well, because you mentioned that you were just recently married when the, the accident happened. How, how important was the support of your, your husband during that time? Did it bother him or was he, in a sense of like, did you feel insecure around him because of, because of the burns? Um, I wouldn't say that I felt insecure around him. I, I think that, you know, he was my, he was the person I, I told that I didn't like my body anymore. A lot. And, um... So at least you, you so yeah. you opened up to him, you didn't sort of hide away in the yeah. shell, but he was, like, he was there for you and you were able to express yourself to him. Yeah, and I mean, as much as he didn't know what I was going through, because that's a thing, is like, it's difficult, he's not, he's not a female, and he, you know, I think for that reason, I don't think he was as cosmetically, sort of, you know, as fixated as I was on, on the issue, but I mean, he was my sounding board for my, my complaints about myself, and he always just said, you know, I, I would love you anyways. Oh, so sweet. Oh, she's doing so well, Bless. You're doing so well, sweet. Okay. So now tell us about life for you now, because obviously you have your goals, you have your ambitions, you're great at what you do. You don't appear, looks, for, for example, doesn't appear when you're on camera that, you know, anything of the past is affecting you. How, what, what are your future goals, your future plans? I don't know. I just... Um I just got a, a master's degree in uh, journalism and I really hope to do fashion and music journalism. Okay. But I also have a teaching degree and I've been doing a lot of teaching jobs too. So I think, you know, life, I'll have a blend of things that I do and I'm not quite sure if I found that thing, but um, I'm just, I'm happy with what I have right now. You know, I'm on the show that's, you know, beyond my wildest dreams. So is having my own radio show at the moment and things like that. Like. I just take it a day at a time, I think, and see where, where life leads you. And Cynthia, just, just a few words for our, our lovely viewers at home that may have been through something similar to yours or, you know, some, something that's affected them emotionally and maybe made them feel bad about themselves. Maybe they look in the mirror and they don't like what they see. What, what advice would you give to them? I would say that it's probably normal what you're feeling. And, mm. you know, over time, I think if you... Uh, over time, you know, it, it, things will get better. It, it will seem as though it could never get better because I remember that was something I was always fixated on. Life mm -hmm. could never be happy again. But that's not the truth, you know, and you will have happier days. And, like, it's just, it is seriously just skin deep, you know, like it's... Simply what you said just now is so, so important that I, I really want to highlight it because it's true with different problems, not just with accidents like this. There are times in life where you do think something's happened or you've lost something or someone and you think, I can never, ever be happy again. And like you said, it's not true. It's a big fat lie, actually. It really is a big fat lie because you can be happy again after something has happened to you or you've lost someone or something. You can. And, you know, that's so important because there are people that because they think they're not going to be happy again, they even take their own lives. And then it's like everything's finished. Yeah. So, you know, that is, I'm so glad you said that, Cynthia, because I think <laughs> just to finish on that point is excellent, you know, for our viewers. And thank you so much, my You're darling. Welcome. You did so Thanks well. <laughs> and you did it. You spoke about it on TV. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you so Good much, sweetheart.
So Cynthia was very brave to talk about what happened to her and I'm so glad that she did manage to change things around. Well, don't go away because after the break, I'll be giving my own tips on keeping a positive mental attitude at work. And also we have a video from Ben Cooper with exercises. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, which today has been all about keeping healthy and safe at work and also what the employer's responsibilities are, but also the employee's responsibilities. And if you've missed the beginning of this program, don't worry, you can head over to our YouTube channel in a few days time, subscribe Chrissy B Show and this program will be there in a few days time. So now let me go through my own tips on keeping a positive mental attitude at work. So my first point is to start the day off right so that obviously includes eating the right kind of breakfast the right kind of food um, maybe even reading something positive because sometimes people already start their day by reading the newspapers and often there is bad news there so maybe instead of reading bad news read some positive news to get you in the right frame of mind and of course you can do some exercise maybe first thing in the morning when you wake up to get those energy levels up and actually before I go on to my next point we do have some exercise tips from Ben Cooper so let's take a look at this Hi and welcome to Move360 Studios, my name is Ben, uh, we're here with the Chrissy B Show and today is all about feeling good, so I'm going to get as many muscles working in the body as possible um, so the whole body feels good, it feels like it's had a great workout and you end up feeling better. First exercise we're going to do, we just need a couple of dumbbells, if you haven't got dumbbells just use some books, or some cans, anything you've got at home, just hold them in front of you, we're going to squat down and come up, squat down and come up, holding the dumbbells this way keeps your back nice and upright and you get to work your biceps and your upper back at the same time as you're squatting. And you want to do about 10 to 12 reps of those squats. Then with your same dumbbells we're going to go into a shoulder width stance, bend of the hips, nice straight back and then pull through with the arms. So like a scarecrow, just a few teaching points, just let the arms hang down and then you're pulling back from the elbows. If you don't have weights, you can just hold yourself like this with the arms out and hold for about a minute. That'll be quite tough because that'll really work the extensors in the back. Okay. And now we're going to go on to uh, our push-ups, which are down onto the mat. So you're just going to use your body weight. Um, a few teaching points on how to do a proper push-up. Make sure your chin stays in. So watch me when you do it, and then I'll explain it again. So down, chin comes in. So a lot of people try and get their head down to the ground, which pulls you into very bad posture. So the chin comes forward. Make sure it's the chest that's going to the, to the floor. And the elbows can stay about 45 degrees from the shoulder and pushing up from there. So watch me again on that. Okay, and then you should have a really good push up that works your abs, your chest, your arms pretty much your whole body along with the rest of the exercise. And if you struggle to do a full push-up, um, you can do a slightly easier version, which you stay on your knees, so cross your feet at the back, but make sure again the same principles, the chin stays in, chest to the floor, and back up. Okay, you don't want to do it like this, that's not a push-up. We're going to go here, hips come forward, chest comes down, chin stays in. Push. 
That way we still work the abdominals, otherwise they just get left behind and no one wants to leave their abdominals behind. <laughs> So talking of abs, we're going to go on to a more specific abdominal exercise. I call this navel radiation. The belly button is the navel, so we're going to radiate around it to work the abdominal wall. So lying down on your mat, spread out like a starfish, and then you're going to come up to the middle, and then control back up. Okay, and open the arms and legs back where they were. Come up again and control down. So when you're doing that one, try and keep your tongue to the roof of your mouth. That helps to use the right mus muscles in your neck. And try and breathe out as you come up and breathe in as you go back. And you'll really feel that start to, to work those abdominal um, muscles. And it's a great compliment after the muscles uh, we've already worked, so the whole body has got to work out in those four exercises. Thanks very much to Ben. So my second point is to, well, don't take it personally. So if, for example, a manager tells you off about something or draws your attention to something that maybe you've done wrong or haven't done as expected, don't see that as a personal attack or that they don't like you. And to be honest, it's unpleasant on their side as well to have to um, approach an employee or approach someone and say that something isn't going well. So if something has happened like that, take the uh, advice on board and just improve and don't maybe start changing your behavior towards that person because that is that can be seen as quite childish so in in a workplace it's good to okay things happen don't take things personally and just move on just improve and move on and and don't don't be different with everyone around you or with that particular person because it just creates a bad atmosphere and it will affect you in your workplace my third point is don't compete. So make sure you work together with people instead of trying to outshine or even take the credit for things that you've not actually done or maybe that you've partly done. And remember that people can actually see what you post on social media. So for example, what you put on LinkedIn, most people can see if they're your friend or sometimes I think certain things you can see even without you know, some connecting with someone. And if you've written things on there and you sa you've said, you know, I've achieved this and I've done, I've done this in my workplace, I've done that in my workplace, when actually it was a team effort. People that see those things that you've written, even your managers, your employers, they can get quite disgruntled and think, well, you know, this person's trying to take the credit for everything. And actually it's, it's something that either they didn't do or maybe it was done as part of a team and maybe you played just a small part in that. So be very, very careful what you write because people do read things, people do share things and you could create quite a, a difficult uh, working environment to work in which will end up being a detriment to you in the end. My fourth point is use positive language. Now, if someone, for example, asks you how it's going or how your day is, you don't need to go into a whole spiel about what's going on and all the difficulties with your job and just keep complaining. Obviously, if you are going through some kind of stress, something is going on that you need help with, speak to the right person, either your line manager or HR. So it's important to open up. But in general, if things are just maybe not going your way that day, you don't need to let everyone know about it. It, it kind of puts you in a bad light, but also it puts you down because because what you say has power. The, the, your words have an effect on you as well, not just the people around you. So just, just be a bit wary of that. And actually, to be honest, sometimes we kind of stop appreciating our work. Because if you went to another job tomorrow, there'll also be difficulties and there'll be faults there. So I think it's just a, a case of learning to deal with, with particular things that you may be going through or maybe aren't ideal in your working environment, but also remembering to look at the things that are great about your workplace and not become ungrateful. Okay, so those are my four points for today and I hope those have helped you in some way. Now we have reached the end of today's program, but if you have a story that you would like to share on this program, maybe you've been through something or maybe there's something that you would like to see uh, talked about on this show, do get in touch with us via our website, chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And if you want to know more about me and how I overcame all my mental health issues that I had in the past, you can visit my personal website, mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time, bye-bye for now.
Well, I've really enjoyed it, Chrissy, and uh, we'd love to come back if I'm invited. This is a really important issue. It's a global issue. It's becoming increasingly more important. And if I can play a tiny part in helping, that's great. That's what I want to do. And also, it was uninventful because talking about stress in the workplace, uh, I was on a, a line today, a tube line on the way up here where the train broke down. So I was nearly late and that was kind of stressful, but in the great scope of things, so what? Anyway, great. Thanks a lot. Bye. It was really good. Um, I always really enjoy coming on the Chrissy B Show, um, sharing my experiences from working in HR. Um, so yeah, always a pleasure to come on. To explain more about World Day for Health and start again. Sorry, I was almost there. There you go. <laughs> oh, okay. What's wrong?